Germany, we Lutherans, we just rock. <laughs> well, you go home a little bit disappointed. Because yeah. you may come really dry. And you can say, God, we really got it? We've been declining year after year after year. We ha- God, there got to be more. So you've got to have a teaching where you can turn up somewhere and say, God, I want more. Yes. And uh, anyway, I don't give you the whole point. But do you know that it's actually not complicated? Uh, I don't find it complicated in the Bible. That uh, the baptism with water and the baptism with the Holy Spirit are meant to come right at the beginning of the Christian faith. You know, no maturity level required to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, but you know, it, it helps to be in a place where they got faith for it. Things actually work by faith. But in, even in the Bible, there's so many instances where the two do not go and coincide. You already have it in Acts 8, where all the people in Samaria, they, were, they came to faith, they were baptized with water, and then the Bible says, none of them had yet been filled with the Holy Spirit. So how do you deal with that? I guess the first time um, when the question arose, I had the visit of the Queensland president by the time. And uh, I said, I'm not going to be obstinate. You know, I'm fully committed to the Bible and whatever. If you can show it to me in the Bible, just explain those passages to me. And we went to Acts 8, and that was it. (laughs) Um, And even, do you know, um, one of the lecturers and, and then became principal of Luther's seminary at the time, he wrote a book, Led by the Spirit. And he wrote... Uh, He argues against it, but he wrote in his book, you know, um, if you take it face value, what it says in Acts 8, it seems incontestable. It is literal and obvious in in its direct simplicity. So if you just take it face, face value, what's in the Bible, and there are other passages as well where it's not one and the same event. If you just take it face value and just believe what it says, it's not that complicated. Okay. No, I hope now it gets, um, if I'm getting into any trouble, it's got going to be over this one. <laughs> Preach it. Preach it. Preach it. <laughs> the LCA is now 49, 49 years old, and we have our 50th anniversary next year. And I would contend very strongly that we've been paying a price for building our denomination on the wrong foundation. Um, In 66, we adopted the document of union which states, according to the word of God and our Lutheran confessions, church fellowship presupposes unanimity in the pure doctrine of the gospel. We reject all religious syncretism or unionism and we cannot acknowledge ourselves to be in fellowship with churches which, which we are not one in doctrine and practice. The key words in our foundational statements is that in order to be church, in order to be a denomination, we've got to be unanimous in our thinking and we've got to un- be uniform in our practice. So the foundation of our church is unanimity and uniformity. Why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? But, but, you know, the foundation really should be Christ. But unanimity and uniformity, it's, I don't know whether you can, can you see the pride of it. The, the, the arrogance of it. Um, it's basically saying, 1966, we Lutherans, we just rock. You know, the way we think now, the purity of our understanding of the gospel... And the way we practice our faith, the way we do worship and outreach and everything, our thinking and our practice is going to be the foundation for church unity for generations to come. That's the foundation. If people want to be one with us, they've got to adopt our thinking, the brilliant thinking of 1966 and the brilliant practice of 1966. You've got to have a pretty high opinion of how far you've advanced in the Christian faith to say that the way I am now determines church unity for generations to come. And the way we... Um, I'm not overstating the case, by the way. We, we warned repeatedly in our um, constitutional statements against sinful unionism. 
it's a bit of a word I didn't even understand what's sinful unionism but it's basically creating the appearance um, of unity with other Christians when we're not totally one in everything we're not unanimous or uniform and in our thesis of agreement again our foundational writings we say we warn against the failure to reject and denounce every opposing error and then it warns and counsels church members not to attend worship services of other churches to avoid promiscuous worship promiscuous worship I thought what does that mean what? so let's say as a Lutheran you join an evangelical Presbyterian church and you you join them in Sunday morning worship are you engaging in promiscuous worship I mean where, where's that word coming from and then I thought that's straight from the Bible isn't it God, God said through the prophets he, he took issues with his people when they were worshipping other gods. That was promiscuous. It's, it's committing adultery, basically, having other lovers, taking other lovers, not God, worshipping other gods. That's promiscuous. That's idolatry. And we use the same word to s talk about our fellow brothers and sisters of other denominations. If we join them at Sunday morning worship, so that's promiscuous. I would say, that is wrong. That is arrogant. That is full of pride. And it's not a foundation we can be proud of, and it's not a foundation that we can build on. I really believe that got to be addressed. We cannot let that stand. And even if it means that we change our foundational writings. Because the way it was expressed, I, I talked about the Billy Graham crusade before. I mean, wouldn't we be happy to have a guy like that come again to Australia, and all of Australia talks about Jesus again? I mean, wouldn't we want to be part of it? But it, according to our foundations, that's not possible. That is sinful unionism. Because we've got to denounce every error. Every error. I, I, I entered the seminary in 87. So that's 20 years after that synod resolution about Billy Graham. And I was still asked to write an essay how he was wrong. That's 20 years after that. And if you don't find fault with Billy Graham, you didn't get a good mark. <laughs> and and I, I read his book even back then, I thought, that's pretty good. <laughs> what mark did you get? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. Repent. Don't repent. Two, two things. The price we've been paying is basically if you build a church on that foundation, it damns you to be frozen in time. And we have been. If, if you think the way you think, 66, you've got to be unanimous and uniform. It's basically any new thought, any growth, any new topic, anything that gets introduced where you say oh maybe we've got to repent and learn something new is threatening the very foundation of the church any new thought is breaking up unanimity and uniformity which basically says we've got to disband so it basically sets up a church where you cannot have an open dialogue where you cannot have diversity where people cannot be free and learn things and express things and be around the table because as soon as we're not totally one and unanimous and uniform we are in trouble because we built the church on that and we haven't been able to talk about things and for the last well um, those that were no, remember longer, for decades, and I've been on the Commission on Theology, we talked about the same topics until the cows come home. They, you know, they, they were topics in, in, in 1966, and we kept hammering the same old topics because we tried to be unanimous on it. And it's just, it's not the, it's not the core of the church. There can be diversity, and people will... Anyway, we're just going round and round and round and round and anything new is going to be a problem and you know when you really think about it according to our constitution if you're really honest we're living in sinful unionism with ourselves already <laughs> right uh, have you have you had the experience you put 10 passes in a room and you got 12 different opinions <laughs> 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 
And uh, you know, for for 15 years now, or how long, we've been discussing the um, hot potato of whether we should ordain women or not to the ministry, public ministry, right? Are we unanimous and uniform in that? No. So are we living in sinful unionism with ourselves over that issue? Probably. <laughs> so, so faith, repentance, experience, baptism, church, preaching, preaching. It took me quite a few years of ministry to finally understand that you can preach a sound sermon but have no power with it. And it's, it's a bit of a difficult to, truth to hear when you're laboring away and faithfully slaving away and you know, you're doing the best you can, you preach faithfully, nothing ever happens, it's pretty depressing, but you're serving with a faithful heart. It may be a bit challenging and confronting to say, but it's true. You can preach with the best heart, with faithful attitude. You can preach exactly the Bible. You can preach a sound sermon, but it can have no power if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And in, in my upbringing, I was never taught that that was important too. Um, but the clearest example where I see it in the Bible is that Jesus rose from the dead. He catches up with his disciples. And the Bible says he explained the scriptures to them, everything about him. And then the Bible says God supernaturally opened their minds so they could understand everything about him. So the disciples, they were doctrinally sound. They could have preached a long sermon and it would have been all the truth. But Jesus said, well, you're not ready. You just wait in Jerusalem until you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you preach before you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it will actually have no result. You wait for the Holy Spirit and when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you can preach and then it will have a result. Um, I had to learn that. Then you have to learn how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, prayer is really good. <laughs> So just spend a bit of time in prayer before you preach and it will make a difference. <laughs> so um, anyway, so preaching prayer. You know, for years and years and years, I was a Christian and I never ever heard God say anything to me. Prayer was pretty tedious because, you know, the only one that was talking was me as far as I was concerned. And it just gets a bit one-sided. One and um, we did a resource in 2006-2007, uh, a Baptist resource, recommended to us by a Presbyterian pastor, and we Lutherans did it. <laughs> and, and there's one line that says, if you have trouble hearing God speak, you are in trouble at the very heart of your Christian experience. If you have trouble hearing God say anything to you, you are in trouble at the very heart of the Christian experience because how can he guide you and how can you be led by the Holy Spirit if you never pick up anything? It's probably my contention that there are huge segments in the LCA that do not know how to hear the voice of God. Um, I distinctly remember when I was on the Commission on Theology, I was quite innocent. Uh, innocently, I made this comment that, like, you know, a bit of change in the ministry, and I actually pray in the morning and say, God, show me what you got planned for the day. So where do you want me to... Just open, God, talk to me a little bit about what you want me to do. And I had three bishops, one after the other, squashing that thought that that's not how it's happening today. We got the Bible... And we work out theology from that, and then we just take it from there. We just, you know, think theologically about a problem and just work it out. But to actually think that there's a, a, a still small voice of God guiding you in what you're meant to be doing, it's a bit of a new thought. And it's, it's a contested thought. I, I know of Rob Edwards, where, you know, it's just, uh, yeah. And you told me last year in a committee. You were talking about that and it was a really divided view on that as well. Um, 
Oh, I'm already in it, so I'm, I add this one as well. <laughs> I, I, see, I see boldly, yeah. <laughs> Do you know that women's ordination for the last 15 years been the most divisive, high profile, a thing that we wrestled with as a church. It right, right at the core. Um, all the you know, National Synod gatherings was all taken up with that. Commission on Theology, all of that. And some of us, you know, we think, well, we've got other things to talk about, but it's so taken up with everything. So it was the most, in, in profile and time and energy, the most important question, does God want us to ordain women to the public ministry or not? So... If God still talks today, leadership, this is how it works. You hear what he says and you do what he says. Amen. And so, yes, I'm making a point. So any leadership, if you're a pastor, any leadership, your job is to hear from God and then get the whole church to hear from him. So it's not about what you want or I want or anyone wants. It's really what does God say and you get him. So 15 years ago, and, and I was there and I was pretty upset when it happened, the um, general bishop at the time, he said, this is so divisive, this is so divisive and uh, I want to be diplomatic and whatever. And when it comes to a vote of declaring where God wants us to go in the church, I'm going to abstain and be anonymous. I'm, I'm neutral. And the argument was, I've got to be neutral as bishop so all sides will still accept me as, as their spiritual shepherd. And ever since 2015, after Synod, after Synod, all the bishops, when it comes to, should we ordain women or not? You know, some people say, yes, I believe God says that. Some people say, no, God says no. And the bishops say, no opinion. We abstain. Which, which is not leadership. It's not spiritual leadership. It's not saying... I mean, that's when we need the bishops. Yes. I mean, that's why we got leaders. They got to hear from God and tell the church what they think. We may not agree, but at least they got to have an opinion. I mean, that's their job. Because if you, if you don't have an opinion and hearing from God, I mean, what are you then? You're an administrator. That, really, that's all then. You're administering a process, but you're not guiding the church into the will of God. I do think there's a, there's a point there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, last, 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 I got one. Hey. Oh, I'm in trouble, but you know, I, I may seem boldly, I'm now in it. Um, I, it's just like I've, I waited a few years for this, so, but I think changing changing the agenda of what we want to talk about the last one I want to talk about is worship I've lived through the worship wars right? we call them the worship wars and I totally missed it at the time I was and I was in it hey I was completely convinced the future of the church saving the numbers and you know getting everything happen is you got to embrace contemporary worship and I was in Toowoomba where everyone, everything was traditional and liturgical and I thought if you just break it open and sing more modern songs they have a band up there everything's going to be fixed <laughs> ah, it's not the case <laughs> it's not the case and I miss something if you just change the instruments and the songs whatever but you don't change the heart of worship and the understanding of worship, you're not changing anything. Um, and we had worship, good contemporary worship for years and year after year, so like Sunday after Sunday, you know, attendance is really great, the offering is great, everything is great. But I just like, God, is, is that all there is of you? I just go home from church and it's like, I just want a bit more of God. I just, I'm not satisfied. It's just my hunger is not, my thirst is not quenched. And then, I mean, it took me years. It's just a bit embarrassing to say. It took me years to realize there's something else going on in worship. I was under the understanding, as long as it was sound, 
you know, approved by the bishop and the theologians of the church, and you said the, you said everything right, and we stand at the right time, and we stand at the right time, and everything is just right. As, as, as long as the doctrine is right, then you automatically have the presence of God. I thought, if the word is correct, you automatically God is there. And then I discovered that in the Bible, the tabernacle in the Old Testament is built on the model in heaven. Which basically means that some principles of worship in the tabernacle that are eternal. They always work. Yeah, we no longer have you know, blood of goats and bulls, whatever, Jesus. Uh, but there's one principle in the tabernacle that still applies today and I never got it. And that is that when we worship, begin to worship, we start at the outer court. And you know, the outer court is a bit hard because we still think about the weak and get distracted. And it's just like, oh, it takes a bit of discipline there. We repent and deal with stuff. Outer court. And then we worship a while in the outer court. And then the, prison, the Spirit of God comes and He takes us into the holy place. And suddenly we are in a different place with God. And prayer gets easier. The gifts flow, we may sense the presence of God and all of that. And then the Holy Spirit may take you even deeper and you go into the Holy of Holies. So there is a progression of the intensity of God in worship that we've got to be sensitive about. And I never knew the first thing about it. And I would say, and um, the scripted rigid way we set up worship where you know I lie you know uh, confession time um, in Germany when we did further study uh, I, I never I, I could never get excited about the liturgy and sometimes I would just would skip it and just come for the sermon and you could do that because you know exactly oh it's 1018 they're exactly saying that 1020 1025 now is it that everything goes to spend being and the Holy Spirit is not always like that. Right. You know, sometimes you know, we race through the confession, but sometimes the, the Holy Spirit says, No, you're not done. That's right. There's more confession happening today, more repentance today. And and so there gotta be an openness to flow with the Holy Spirit because He takes you in and you can't say Five minutes we are in the outer court and then two and a half in the Holy of Holies and then we really spend time in he, he does it the way he does it and we've got to be sensitive to it and then I discovered that one of the greatest proponents in our church for traditional liturgical worship um, John Kleinick uh, very influential um, influenced a lot of pastors when he was a student and he wrote that in a book that he's recently published when he was a student he said he, he got so agitated and upset because whenever he went through the liturgy his mind was distracted and going into all sorts of different areas in his life about you know stuff and he, he wasn't focused on the words and what they were going through and uh, finally he, he looks up a lecture and he you know, at length complains about it and the devil is such an attack at me I'm always distracted I can't stay on the page and then the lecturer, you know, probably wanted to go to morning tea. It wasn't a long thing. He said, oh, who says it's the devil? Perhaps it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then I quote from his book, that bit of advice has proved to be the best spiritual counsel I've ever received. <laughs> that is a pretty big word when you say that decades after that, the best spiritual counsel I've ever received. So, and now I understand why the traditional liturgy works for him. Because he lets it just go past, you know, the, the ritual can go, but he allows his mind to wander and go wherever the Spirit takes it. And so when the, when the Holy Spirit wants to bring up, you know, something about his life or apply a certain word, he allows it to happen and he's no longer actually listening to, to the rest of the congregation going through it. And I said, well, that's exactly the principle. You've got to be open to the Holy Spirit and He takes you where He takes you. But not everyone is capable of ignoring what the whole congregation goes through. Not everyone manages to let the mind wander when you know all the, all the words are up there. So for some people, when they worship, a, a, a good worship team, a good worship band can do it and actually can take you in and be sensitive to what's actually next on God's agenda. 
Okay, I'm, I'm finishing here. I was a bit nervous about this talk, um, how this is going to come out. So if it's not come out completely pure and a few of my emotions and experiences come in, I, I do apologize. Um, I don't expect that everyone will agree on all points. Uh, I really don't. But I, I think I've made the case that we have to talk about some core, core teachings of the faith again in the LCA. And I would say, I want to talk about saving faith, repentance, Christian experience, baptism, church, preaching, prayer and worship. And did you notice, I, I didn't even talk about the Holy Spirit specifically as a heading. Um, and I, I want to submit to you and whoever is going to watch the video that this is not the time anymore for anonymous complaints. This is a time for open dialogue and we've got things on the agenda as a church that I really think we need to talk about. Um, and I probably, I don't know, I would submit it to you. Maybe this is a renewal agenda that we want to pursue. Amen. 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 Amen.